practice in health uh, preference research. There's a slight semantic tweak in the issue name of the patient from best to good. So we're happy to have good practices uh, here today. Thank you to IHEA, uh, IOPRA and the patient for their collaboration on the webinar series. Um, and just a little bit of admin on the webinar series itself. We've got uh, hot off the press, a Christmas treat for everybody on the 17th of December. Uh, we've got Reed coming to talk to us about uh, what can DCEs tell us about patient preferences and analysis of choice data. Um, so back to today, we've got another stellar cast, uh, big beasts of the preference world with us today to talk about stated preference survey design uh, and testing. Um, as in our previous webinars, the content's based on the IOPERA and the patient series. It's designed to give those new to the field a solid overview uh, of these topics, but I'm also conscious we've got a range of experience uh, in the room. So after um, folk have finished pre presenting, we'll open up for Q&A and please pop any questions that come to you in the meantime in the chat. Um, I'm going to hand over to Eureen to share slides and I think Ellen uh, to kick us off. Great, I'll just wait. Okay. Um, thank you all very much for joining this webinar. Um, as the title suggests, we will be speaking about survey design and testing of your survey um, for preference, state of preference um, instruments in health applications. Um, Yurin, could you forward the slide? Um, so this was done um, as part of the um, IAPRA patient um, set of papers on <clears throat> um, different considerations for doing health preference research. Um, this is our um, star list of authors. I was extremely lucky to be to be able to work with um, with this amazing group of researchers. Um, I won't go into too much detail um, regarding their qualifications, um, but this is the order that we'll be presenting in. So we have Jorin Veldweg, who's an associate professor at Erasmus uh, University. We have uh, Dr. Shelby Reed, who's a professor at uh, the Duke Clinical Research Institute, and then Deborah Marshall from the University of Calgary. Um, I work at Johnson & Johnson. Um, <clears throat> what we are um, talking about today is um, survey design and testing. So I think we can probably all agree that one of the major goals of conducting health preference research is to elicit high quality state of preference data. Um, and that means that we try to collect thoughtful responses from well-informed and engaged respondents. And that the data we collect and the preferences we collect are fit to inform the intended decision. Well, to be able to achieve this goal, um, you need a carefully designed preference survey that can inform your respondents, that can ensure that they're engaged, and that is also fit for this intended decision, right? Um, so this means that the survey needs to be easily understood. And um, another major goal of these studies is that you minimize the hypothetical bias that's associated, that's inherently associated with stated preference research. Um, so to be able to get a, to a well-designed survey that can do all these things, researchers need to make numerous interrelated decisions. Um, and um, those decisions um, are not made in a vacuum. They, they build upon um, the decision context in which the study is being done, the attributes that are being selected, and then the experimental design of the study. Next slide, please. Um, so this really summarizes that, um, what I had previously said, um, can you animate your <clears throat> What I really want to highlight though, is that this discussion today is not going to focus on conversations regarding decision context, selection of attributes or experimental design. There are other, um, good research practice materials that have covered those topics in depth. Um, and what we, can you animate again? Um, what we are going to talk about is really um, with re like in relation to survey design. Next step, slide. We've organized 
um, this discussion around a, a several figures that are included in the paper that uh, accompanies this presentation if you're interested in reading the paper. Um, one thing we want to highlight is that there are um, survey design considerations that you have to do ad in advance of kind of these tech, the more technical aspects of survey instrument development. Um, so those design considerations include um, questions regarding the study setting and respondent characteristics. For example, are you doing this um, in a predetermined setting, such as in the clinic, or are you going to let patients or sub respondents do the survey at home? What are the languages that you're going to do the survey in? Um, you also need to consider things like what is the format and the mode of administration of your survey? Is it on paper or um, more commonly done nowadays um, in the electronic format? Um, and then there is questions regarding the metadata that you need to collect in order to be able to, um, to get a holistic view of preferences of different uh, types of participants. So what are survey level characteristics, um, response rates, how quickly patient uh, respondents complete the survey, and then also respondent level characteristics, um, which is actually the issues like completion time, uh, what is the screen size, uh, what software are you using, uh, that type of um, information. Next slide. Um, Another aspect of survey design is testing, revising, testing, revising, testing, revising, and finalizing your survey. Um, and what we want to highlight here is that this um, process of testing your survey can be iterative. Um, and um, will result in your survey being updated um, throughout this process. We differentiate between pre-testing, um, or qualitative pretest interviews and uh, quantitative pilot testing interviews, uh, which are both uh, extremely critical and valuable steps to identifying issues with your survey design um, and serve different purposes. So, as you can imagine, uh, qualitative pretest interviews give you a deeper understanding of the survey content and maybe some of the um, interpretation or um, difficulties that patient respondents might have. And then quantitative pilot testing is going to give you sense of um, the direction of your preference estimates um, and um, evaluating uh, consistency, rationality of respondents, and then of course, being able to uh, check for programming errors. Um, next slide, please. Oh. Um, I am missing a. I am missing a figure. Oh, here we go. Um, so this. So ha what we have done in this presentation is we are setting up the discussion um, to cover Figure Two, and we have. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail because my co-presenters will. Um, but just so you understand the um, how we're going to uh, move forward is that we are going to. Um, first spot, speak to the preparation for preference solicitation questions, um, then we'll move into the preference solicitation questions themselves, and then questions on the respondent characteristics. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over uh, to Yoni. Um, and if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will address them at the end. Thanks, um, Helen. And sorry for messing up your slides. <laughs> okay. So um, we're talking about this uh, figure, like Ellen uh, just said, and I will uh, talk you through uh, the first uh, first part of it. So um, before respondents complete uh, any preference solicitation task, uh, they have to be provided with some kind of training related to the content and meaning of all of the attributes and levels that you've included in the study, as well, of course, as to how to complete the choice questions in the survey. And such training is essential to ensure that respondents understand all of this information and the tasks uh, ahead of them. And of course, uh, it's assumed that that uh, contributes to the validity of the preference study outcomes and results. So when designing this uh, educational material, it's important 
to include enough information so that all respondents can make well-informed decisions, but also um, at the same time to limit cognitive burden and disengagement of respondents by, for instance, overwhelming them with too much or unnecessary or irrelevant information. Uh, because uh, this might contribute to drop out of respondents or a drop in their attention and or respondents might be missing essential parts of information. So from a study uh, that we have performed uh, with experts on instructional design um, recently, we've learned that it is important to structure training materials according um, to what respondents need to know, what they need to understand, and what some respondents might want to know in addition uh, to be able to um, answer all of your questions. Oh. <clears throat> So related to the attributes and levels of a preference studies, uh, all of them um, need to be explained and described before respondents answer the choice questions. And preferably we use non-technical language when we do those explanations. So for some attributes, there might already be uh, some clinical definition available, or there might be a definition that's used and tested in a previous preference study. And that can be very helpful, of course, for your own educational material. Um, and reuse of definitions also benefits potential new studies that include, for instance, a literature review or a meta-analysis or any form of benefit transfer. So while all attributes need to be explained, maybe not all levels of all attributes need to be explained in detail. So when we have categorical attributes like the one on the screen now on mode of administration, all levels need, of course, to be mentioned and explained because they have different meanings. So having an injection is something really different from getting a drip or taking a tablet. However, uh, when uh, we have continuous attributes on a ratio scale, like for instance, risks, explaining one of those levels in detail might be considered enough for the majority of the respondents. When explaining risks, please be mindful also of framing effects. In previous studies, we've showed that simple distinct, uh, the simple distinction between five-year survival rate or a five-year mortality rate of the exact same risk number had a gigantic effect on study outcomes with, in the positive frame, this attribute being the most important, while in the negative frame, it being the least important attribute. Please also be mindful that simply presenting all possible frames does not balance out this framing effect by definition. A study that was performed in antibiotic use showed that using either treatment effectiveness, treatment failure, or both of these frames showed different effects and outcomes. So when presenting risks, uh, researchers often use some type of a risk grid or a graphic uh, that can be very helpful and is also uh, usually advised. Uh, but it's very important that if you use such graphics, you also explain them to respondents. And in a recent study on flu vaccination, we've included icon arrays and included um, a description like this, um, sorry, loosely translated from our Dutch survey. So if 100 people get the flu vaccine, that would look like the picture below with 100 gray people. And if the vaccine that these people got is 20% effective, this means that out of these 100 vaccinated people, 20 would not get the flu while 80 people would still get the flu. In other words, 20 out of every 100 people are protected against the flu. And that would look like this. So when researchers design these educational materials, there are different ways in which they can do so. So originally, of course, written text and instructions were used most often. Um, but uh, with the technical advancements these days and the possibilities to conduct also online preference studies, we have opened up uh, new possibilities for training materials. And using videos has resulted in mixed outcomes. There are some studies indicating improved choice consistency and understanding among respondents. However, a word of caution is definitely needed. So simply transferring written text into some kind of attractive video will likely not be effective. 
In a study on preferences for glucose monitoring devices, we've investigated this. And as you can see on this slide, it might have increased the self-reported uh, level of understanding of the educational material itself. It did not improve the understanding of the DCE. It did also not assist in answering um, the DCE. And most importantly, while the video lasted about 10 minutes, the completion time of the survey was equal across the treatment groups. Um, so the study concluded that engagement with the training material actually was very limited. Nevertheless, that of course does not mean that video or game-like material are ineffective um, as a whole. However, um, it should, they should be very carefully tailored to the respondent population. Alternatively, surveys can use a click-through example, <clears throat> and that we've done in a previous study on RA prevention where we showed um, the choice task. This is an example. Uh, every time you can choose between taking a treatment or not taking a treatment, there are four um, features describing uh, the alternatives. They are always the same. Then there is a treatment alternative that has different levels for these features. And then there's a no treatment alternative. And you can indicate your choice at the bottom of um, this sort of table. While carefully designing these training materials, and that is very important, it's also important to assess respondents' attention and understanding of uh, your training materials and the message you wanted to convey. So one option is to include, for instance, comprehension or quiz questions. And such questions can be on different attributes, but also on different levels, if you will. And the design of these questions heavily depends on what respondents need to know and what they need to understand. So for instance, in a recent survey, we quizzed respondents both on their gist understanding of effectiveness of flu vaccines, as well as their verbatim understanding of those risks. So you have flu vaccination A and flu vaccination B, and we asked them if you have to choose between these vaccines only based on how effective they are, which would you choose, uh, which um, assesses their gist understanding and their verbatim understanding was tested by other questions. For instance, imagine that 100 people get flu vaccine A and they get exposed to the flu virus. How uh, many would, according to you, be protected against the flu? So in another study on RA prevention, um, understanding the risks was important, but it was mostly important also that respondents were aware of the fact that uh, having a first degree relative with RA increased their own likelihood of developing the disease. So comprehension questions not necessarily need to assess risks. They can also be about this type of information. Well, incorrect responses uh, to such comprehension questions can serve as a potential indicator, of course, that respondents did not understand the content or did not engage with it. And researchers can consider providing the right answer after each quiz question in case respondents answer those questions wrong and see that as an additional training moment. Um, additionally, evaluating the performance on such comprehension questions together with other indications, indicators such as completion time, flatlining, random choice or dominant choice can be very useful to identify individuals who did not engage with your survey. And although there's no clear decision rule, nor there's a threshold about what is considered acceptable or not acceptable, researchers themselves might beforehand design their own decision rule and decide to exclude particular respondents based on their, um, in their analysis or in their sensitivity analysis. So finally, before respondents start answering their choice questions uh, in a preference survey, it is common to practice and show an example choice task. This can either be a full choice task that is part of your experimental design. However, in that case, it's advised to randomize the order in which respondents see the choice task, since we know that there will be a learning effect with the first task being the most in, um, hard to complete. 
Um, it can also, for instance, be a very simple task with the dominating alternative. And although this might be very attractive from a training perspective, making it a very easy choice, um, it might on one hand annoy respondents and it might also lead to complex outcome outcomes because it's not certain that people who do not pick the dominating alternative did not understand the task as their choice might still reflect their actual preferences. Alternatively, researchers can also consider to include build-up tasks that include part of the attributes. So here, for instance, only effectiveness for flu vaccinations. Here there's three flu vaccination alternatives with two attributes, and then we can build that up until we have the full choice task. So in summary for this part, Adequate balanced educational material is essential for the valid assessment of preferences in stated preference surveys. And we need to disentangle what respondents need to know, what they need to understand, and what they might want to know in addition when we design these training materials. And when we've designed the training materials, we might want to include um, questions that test the knowledge uh, in a suitable and tailored manner. One remaining question that I have uh, and that um, might be nice uh, to discuss later or that you might want to question yourself is when is the educational material good enough and do we need to uh, make respondents subject matter experts? So to what level do we educate them before they um, get to go to our choice questions? And with that, I um, will hand over to Shelby. Thanks so much, Yurian. Um, so I will continue um, the discussion really focusing on the preference elicitation questions. Yurian did an excellent job getting us to, to this point. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about presenting risks again. Um, Yurian just presented a, a, you know, um, a lot of information on how we train people to think about risk levels. Um, but then I'll also um, discuss a, a risk communication study that we did and refer to some studies in the literature. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, again, just uh, to reiterate a little bit more the importance of training on the choice task layout. Um, this is an example of what we did um, in, a, in a study in ovarian cancer where we were differentiating gains in progression-free survival, as well as gains in overall survival. So the next slide shows um, how that, uh, one of the comprehension questions that we used. Um, let's just go on since you were in, described these in a great amount of detail. Um, you know, for people who are newer to this field, um, this is representative of a typical choice task layout where the attribute levels or at labels are shown on the left-hand column we have a clearly described opt out column um, that might be described as no treatment or treatment break, whatever is appropriate for the given decision context. We have our constructed treatment profiles shown in this case as medication A and medication B. Um, and we you know, have noted the incremental gains in progression-free survival and overall survival with the different colors. Um, we've used graphics sparingly to try to differentiate the different levels of nausea and fatigue. And we've also used icon arrays to help uh, people understand different risk levels. So in the next slide, um, again, this is more of our standard practice shown on the left. Um, and this uh, was a study and I'll be presenting on this particular study over the next few slides. Um, where we had a research question that um, really uh, required that we include four probabilistic attributes, which goes against our rules. Like we just do not like to include all probabilistic attributes. It's difficult for people to understand, but we really couldn't get away from it in this particular um, context. Um, really did map to the decision problem at hand. So we also recognize that many people are using mobile phones to respond to surveys, to respond to the types of, and we, we generally don't like this, but what we tried to do in this case is to optimize our choice task layout to work on a mobile phone. 
So instead of having the left-hand column, we've taken that off and tried to integrate all of the descriptive information about the attributes into the, the choice task layout itself. We also tried to emphasize the fact that we only we had two separate events, um, chance of symptoms returning and needing a second procedure and death, but at two time points, okay? Um, so we've we changed the layout to the one shown on the right-hand side. Next slide, please. So recognizing that we had a real challenge here with regard to risk communication, uh, before conducting the main DCE, we conducted a randomized, what we called risk communication study. Um, and so we developed several different layouts and we tested them using um, 12 comprehension questions, as well as um, three DECE questions to evaluate consistency across them. So um, just to you know, present the different layouts that we tested um, as shown um, on the left-hand side, the separate risks is consistent with the, the one I just showed on the previous slide. But then we also, knowing that we um, were looking at two different time points, we um, developed um, what we called integrated icon arrays, where we were showing the um, probabilities for the two different outcomes within one icon array. Um, and so we did that at both time points um, and, and that representation is shown on the right. So on the next slide, um, we uh, keep going. I think that's the same one. Sorry, I didn't realize all this animation was still there. Um, so we also recognize that whether we um, you know, had integrated icon arrays or we had separate icon arrays, this still might be information overload. And so we removed the icon arrays and we tested um, text only versions um, where we showed the risks separately and in an integrated fashion to match up with the um, integrated icon arrays. So next slide, please. Um, the other thing um, in this particular study was that we had this time element um, where the risks increased over time. And since time is often presented on an x-axis, what we did in this case is we um, you know, transformed the choice questions to show um, time in a horizontal fashion. Um, so we did that again with the, um, the separate icon arrays and the integrated icon arrays as shown here. So the next slide represents a, an overall view of the seven risk communication formats that we tested. In addition, there was a, a bar chart format that we used. We thought it was promising um, given that we could emphasize the rate of increase between year two and year five. And so we randomized about 1,200 individuals to these seven um, you know, presentations. Um, and I'll show you the results on the next slide. Okay, so across the 12 comprehension questions that we designed, um, testing different um, you know, aspects of those um, choice task layouts, we found that there was a difference between, a systematic difference between um, showing risks in separate icon arrays or, or separately, I should say, um, versus um, the integrated format. Um, people did better when the risks were shown separately. Um, the horizon or the bar charts came out somewhere in between. So in the next slide, um, you can see that there is one there was one question that um, was um, particularly difficult for people seeing the integrated, information. And it, it seemed like a relatively simple question. And it was, uh, it was which device led fewer people to fewer people having their symptoms come back by two years. And again, with integrated formats, people had a really difficult time with that. So next slide, please. We um, did simple linear regression to evaluate what were the, the factors contributing to higher and lower um, performance on the comprehension questions. And we found, in fact, the integrated um, risk information uh, performed more poorly. There was not a significant difference between the horizontal and vertical formats showing the, the time element. Um, and there was not a difference between the, the text only versus the inclusion of icon arrays. Um, and we also 
um, found that the bar chart performed more poorly on average. We also had a host of other participant characteristics that were um, significantly associated with performance on the comprehension questions. So next slide, please. In our main DCE study, um, we ended up uh, randomizing people between um, what we thought was representative more of our, our standard format, although you know modified to um, for, for mobile phone use. Um, we randomized patients to that version or the version without the icon arrays. So on the next slide, I show you the results in terms of our estimates of maximum acceptable risk of five-year mortality, which was you know, the main outcome of interest in this study. And we showed that there was not a significant difference um, when we included or not, did not include the icon arrays. So next slide, please. Um, certainly there have been many other studies published in the literature looking at um, you know, different ways to really assist people in understanding and making comparisons across the alternatives we're showing. So uh, Marcel Yonker and his colleagues um, evaluated the impact of color coding um, or highlighting where there are um, differences or similarities between the different options. And they showed that um, highlighting the overlap or and or color coding um, could decrease the dropout rate, um, improve cognitive debriefing, and it improved the level of choice consistency in the DCE. So on the next slide, please. Um, Yorian has also done some work in this space and um, in this case was comparing a version of a survey that included words um, versus graphics to represent the different uh, attribute levels shown across the choice questions. Um, this one was also around vaccine effectiveness and found that people um, generally preferred the words rather than the graphics. Uh, the word versions resulted in higher choice consistency and showed more valid attribute level estimates. So it found that you know, the graphics really didn't improve people's understanding um, of the attribute levels. So the next slide is just a summary um, to um, kind of show that um, separate, you know, we're showing separate uh, separate risks in the same icon array in integrated fashion reduces understanding. Um, the uh, re so this recent evidence suggests that um, icon arrays does not have a significant influence on risk tolerance measures. Um, we believe that graphics should be used with restraint um, and maybe potentially along with words. Um, color coding may be helpful to differentiate text-based labels. And uh, most importantly, um, you know, these are just one-off studies. We need more studies to evaluate systematically whether these different um, risk presentation formats and other aids, um, you know, behave the same way across different applications. Um, and importantly, um, the learnings that um, we have used from risk communication studies, not including the one I was showing, but in terms of other contexts, applying them in, in decision aids, um, in patient education materials, do not necessarily hold for DCE task layouts. And that is because we um, are asking people oftentimes to do things that are much more difficult, not just in terms of identifying a risk um, and you know, determining the, you know, the magnitude, but actually making comparisons um, between uh, alternatives and, and potentially across time. So we have to be careful there. And, and that's it for my section. I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah now. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Ellen, Ellen uh, Yurveen, and Shelby. I'm Deborah Marshall, and uh, I'm based here in the University of Calgary, where we're early morning, which it looks like many of the participants are not, but um, really happy to be here today and with this team. Um, I do hope you'll read the paper. Um, I think Matt had uh, introduced this, and there was a comment made about that. Um, because I think it's a sort of an interesting compilation of 
a long list of things to think about, actually, um, all squished up into a few pages. Um, and I must confess, and I think all of us would agree, this was a challenging paper to write. Um, because in the end, there's a lot of choices um, we have to make in designing a choice experiment and designing a preferences study. And I hope that um, it will be helpful um, to people who were brave enough to join this call in the Christmas uh, holiday, holiday time craze, um, which we appreciate in December. Um, but I think it's helpful um, to think about both the art and the science per se of the work. And we continue to build and grow and contribute to this science, um, but there's also a lot of art you have to think about um, and balance and make choices in which way to go. So uh, if we have the next slide, please, Noreen. Um, going back to the figure two, we kind of use this to loosely um, structure uh, this presentation, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the respondent characteristics and try to do something different than what's being discussed now. But I do want to emphasize what Ellen said at the very beginning. Focus on high quality data, well-informed and engaged respondents, and these are all interrelated. So it is a little diff difficult to completely separate all these things. Um, and yes, I think all of our figures uh, would have been nicely done almost in circular form because you, you don't really finish one and stop the other one. <laughs> it's not linear by any uh, means. So I think that's one thing to bear in mind as well. But when we think about um, the uh, respondent characteristics in the paper, you'll see there's four things, you know, thinking about where's the setting um, that you're administering this. Is it at the home or in the clinic? That can affect some of your decisions um, in this context. The assistance level, you know, how much help are people going to need um, to complete the survey? Can they do it by themselves? Again, interrelated to um, if in fact they're doing it at home or in the clinic, uh, what are the options? And then the sample characteristics is about, you know, the target population itself and thinking about any special characteristics of that population. And do you need to make any adaptations of your survey to account for that? Um, and then the other thing is that seems to come up in every survey that we think we've ever done is the experience with the health condition. And that might be the experience of the individual or their experience in caregiving um, with that health condition and observing uh, other people's experience. So for me in this session, there's a lot of different things and you've had quite a lot of discussion about risk attitudes, behaviors, how you present that, et cetera. And the numeracy literacy is coming up. I'm just gonna use a few examples about the specifically around the respondent characteristics um, as a source of discussion here. Um, and there's a lot more material in the paper. Next slide, please. So this is kind of the range of things that when you're thinking about your survey and your instrument, you need to think about um, not only the socio-demographics, which is any survey design is nice, it creates your table one uh, in your paper, you know, who are these people that we surveyed? Um, so that's useful. Um, but then there are all these other considerations, and especially when you listen and hear and think about Irene and Shelby's presentation, you know, what are all the things that might impact um, their ability, A, to do the survey, um, but also to access the survey. Um, and, you know, this comes up a lot um, in terms of, of uh, hard to reach populations and things. And you, sometimes you really need to um, step back and think about how do I design my survey overall in a way that allows me to get to those respondents that I'm interested to hear their voices. So I've also listed other things, you know, the medical background matters, you know, what their disease state is, like what kind of disease we're talking about. If it's really severe, um, you know, that affects um, their views. It might also really affect how you present the information and the mechanisms you use to collect it. So when we do a fair bit of work in um, arthritic diseases, well, sometimes filling out um, surveys is really hard for somebody. So maybe there's a way to uh, approach that um, 
i.e. when you have a helper, for example, who can um, have them complete the survey without having to use their hands. Um, so all of these things factor in. Next slide, please. And the other thing to think about, and this comes back to Ellen's interrelated question, is this thought needs to permeate both the design considerations, the survey instrument development itself, and the whole testing process as well. Um, so one of the things uh, we're not going to say a lot about here, but is really emphasized in the paper and in the figures is this pre-test, pilot test, and the iterative nature of this whole thing. Well, the respondents' characteristics go across this whole um, stream of activities when you're developing, designing, and testing your survey. And what I'm going to also do is just use a simple example here. I could not resist. Um, my colleagues on the phone know that this is um, part of what we're all dealing with now um, is the fraud prevention. And, you know, thinking about if you actually have um, special respondents, I'm going to call them, who aren't actually really respondents and need special attention um, in your survey, both in the design and the testing, etc., all with the goal of getting a high quality data with well-informed real participants um, answering your survey. Next slide, please. So I just have a, a list here um, to think about all of the special specific design characteristics of your population that might affect access or the ability to complete the survey. And I mentioned some few already, um, but you know, there's been a lot of work done, for instance, in uh, mental health. Um, gee, you know, how does that affect um, how you're going to design your survey um, and also validate it? Um, the language is a big deal. I'm just pulling out a few. Recently, we've had to translate our surveys into, we were working in, with immigrant populations. We had to translate it into six or seven different languages um, to make it viable to actually administer the survey. Um, age is a big deal. And I'll show you an example um, with our child health populations. Um, we take a totally different approach to, um, yes, using graphics, but um, Shelby gave us a little bit of a, a warning about understanding. Maybe graphics don't necessarily increase understanding, but they might increase engagement. Um, and certainly with our pediatric population, we need to make the surveys fun. Um, and I can I can assure you uh, that in our testing of this, um, the more fun you make it, the more likely you're going to get your respondents to complete the survey. So that's another um, consideration uh, when you're dealing with those kinds of special populations. Um, so uh, yeah, and uh, I mentioned the hard to reach populations. Next slide, please. So survey instrument, um, you know, there's not only the idea of being able to describe your study population, you know, table one, um, and making sure we understand uh, who is answering it and their characteristics, both from a clinical perspective and a demographic perspective and a socioeconomic perspective, but the other thing to think about, which is on the bottom half of this slide, is about your analysis. So you also have to be planning way in advance, thinking about, am I going to do latent class analysis? How much heterogeneity is here? Um, what would be things that I'm going to hypothesize why it might affect preferences and do I need this in my analysis for subgroups or or different latent class characteristic analysis or to tease out preference heterogeneity? So I've listed a number of things and we found repeatedly disease history matters, their experience with the treatments um, matters. Um, virtually consistently across any disease. So this kind of thing really matters as well as their literacy and Shelby had presented uh, multiple examples of making sure we have understanding um, in the preferences studies. Next slide. And then um, the other piece, thank you, Yurin. Yeah, thanks, um, is the idea of testing it. So um, we can think about this in the whole process of pre-testing and pilot te testing um, to make sure that we have representation um, when we're um, looking and trying to create the final survey. Um, so we will selectively um, look at respondents to get different viewpoints when we're testing. Um, 
And we do this um, in a way to try to make sure um, that we are sensitive and responsive to a variety of ranges of baseline characteristics. Um, and it also has to be manageable. Again, that balancing act between um, you know, what matters methodologically and also what matters from a practical need you to complete the survey perspective. Next slide, please. And then I'll just uh, end here uh, with the fraud point um, because that matters in terms of who you get in terms of respondents. And again, this cuts across the whole stream of design, development and testing. And in fraud, you know, when you're thinking about fraudulent responses, which if you're using online um, surveys, which we do a lot now in preferences studies, and particularly if you're offering any incentives, you really have to be mindful um, about planning and the use of respondent characteristics as screening care uh, criteria. And um, this We've 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 have found that this is an effective way to try to screen out um, people, um, and then there are methods and ideas around identifying um, fraud using respondent characteristics, but also other kinds of fraud scores as well, and having algorithms um, to uh, identify fraudulent respondents and remove them from your sample. So even though I'm a fan of you know all data are relevant and all your Respondents uh, matter, um, even if it doesn't immediately make logical sense. Um, if they're fraudulent, you don't really want them in your sample. <laughs> so these ones you would want to remove. So your respondent characteristics can be really helpful. Next slide, please. So um, some examples here um, are around the characteristics um, in your uh, of your respondents. Um, so we use screening um, questions uh, around um, your respondents um, and make sure that they are consistent, for example, and they meet the criteria because sometimes fraudulent responders are not able to answer those questions. Um, so that's quite important. And we also get um, remove people who aren't um, appropriate meeting the criteria of the survey. Um, we use standardized uh, questions that match, for instance, I'm in Canada, so Statistics Canada has certain categories to describe people in population, so we use those as much as possible to align. Um, and we also include questions around attitudes and behaviors um, when we're collecting uh, the information. Next slide, please. So, I'll just give you an example here of what I think is a fun slide um, for our patients uh, who are pediatric. So we work also a fair bit in inflammatory bowel disease um, and we're working with patients and parents. And so we have a parent version of, this, of the survey, but we spent significant time on the design and testing of this with children. Um, and these are 11 to 18. So they're not young, young children, but um, young children use and it made a huge difference in terms of their engagement and their sort of accessibility to the survey when we used graphics and colors and flow in in the design again it might not improve the um understanding as shelby mentioned from her experiments but in terms of engagement we found this absolutely essential um to have our pediatric um, participants uh, complete the surveys. Next slide, please. And here's another example, um, very graphic, you know, needle. Um, some children actually almost have um, physical reactions when they see a picture of a, a needle. Um, so this is actually important in terms of them reflecting um, that this is uh, characteristics of the treatment and they can visually respond um, even if they don't know some of all the terminologies around it, they know what these treatments are uh, when they're engaged in these. So we found that these kind of very simple graphics and descriptions as well as the words really helped in a child population. Again, this was around um, exploring fecal mycole transplant um, um, in IBD. Next slide. And then um, 
the other example I just want to say is around the internal validity checks. Um, we build these into our surveys um, uh, to the extent we can. And uh, Ellen knows there's many, many, many. She did a lovely paper um, some years ago on all the different tests you can do. Um, but we try to build in um, at least some internal validity checks um, and then examine quite carefully um, with with latent class to understand if this is informative or uninformative. Next slide, please. And then um, this just gives you uh, an explanation of what we also do qualitatively um, to look at our internal validity checks. Um, so we do ask understanding questions, as Shelby uh, showed you in her presentation earlier as well, to try to understand um, why people made the choices they did, even if on the surface they don't seem to uh, make sense from an internal validity check. Next slide. And then just um, ending here on the uh, broad, um, again using our um, inflammatory bowel disease ulcerative colitis example, um, we did um, look at this um, and uh, we included and used latent class analysis um, very heavily to try to understand predictors of class membership. Um, and again, our respondent characteristics and disease history um, really identified um, different groups, um, young, age, and older um, with less severe disease really made a difference in terms of the classes. So having that information matters in your analysis. Last slide, please. Hi, um, I'm so sorry. We do have five minutes left of this session. I just wanted to give heads up in case we wanted to just wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you very much. So my last note was just around the fraud present prevention. Um, and the reality is that um, in this survey, uh, we actually had 75% of our responses were fraudulent. Um, and three of the red flag variables that we built in this age, year of diagnosis and postal code um, for the respondents were red flags uh, for these fraudulent responses. Okay, thank you. So those were the things I just wanted to highlight for you. And I think there's just a key summary point slide, um, which basically says, gee, um, we need to plan really carefully. And I think this again is about um, having the art and the science come together so that we have high quality data uh, and well-informed, engaged, real respondents. And I would add that now after our uh, fraudulent experiences in the last few years. Um, and I hope this uh, paper gives you some good guidance uh, around how to think about that as well as some practical experience. So thank you and over to Ellen. Yeah, thank you, Deborah and Shelby and Yorin. We have <clears throat> A couple of minutes for questions, and um, I've seen some questions pop up in the um, chat around this, you know, concept of educating the respondents. And um, there's a few questions on kind of finding that balance between the well-informed respondent and perhaps um, over-educating your respondent, and how that might impact um generalizability to the you know average patient um and then i also saw a question by karina in terms of um has there been any thought or work done on personalizing education based on respondents different knowledge levels so i'm not sure if maybe the three of you can give a 30 second thought on those um, topics yeah so if I can, I can start. I think I mean totally agree. It's it's uh, if we over educate, it might not be re uh, representative for the patient population. But we should also be mindful that a lot of patients, especially those with the chronic disease, are very educated on their disease. So they might actually be subject matter experts. Um, and the question is, do we not bore them with uh, some of the information that we give? So it's 
again, I want to iterate that it's important to tailor the education to the average patient population, but maybe even also on an individual level uh, with personalized medicine, but also in general, we might want to look at if it is possible to tailor information towards the needs of the participants of a preference survey, which could be possible now, right? If we do these online surveys that offer so many possibilities to also deep dive into this. And we, um, we have a project um, related to that coming up. So exciting. Yeah, I, I would add that's an interesting idea, but it could make the survey longer because then you have to add questions to assess their knowledge before you even provide the, you know, kind of individualized education. So, and then, and then we also, you know, to say we lose control of the experiment because the information we're providing people might be different or it will be different, right? And we don't know what impact that's gonna have on the preferences. So it really depends on what we want. I don't, I don't really think we want preference, you know, to go through a preference elicitation exercise for people who don't understand the attributes. Don't we don't know what we're going to be getting? Um, I think we just maybe I'll. Oh, Deborah, I would go ahead. chime in really briefly. I put some words in the chat, but um, I also think that is it's an interesting area for methodological exploration um, because the reality is um, we want people to have the same information in front of them so that we know they're all reacting to the same information. But at the same time, people make decisions in different ways. And we also don't know if they go and research it separately outside of our survey when they're answering the survey. So we don't really know um, what that effect would be. So a good area to research. Um, Hi, that, sorry, we, team. We I'm are. just going to have to wrap up now. It is 11 o'clock uh, just for timing purposes. Um, if there's any last words, I'll go ahead, Ellen, if you want to make your last final statement, uh, but we do have to wrap up now. Yeah, I was going to say we're at time. Um, please, if you do have any burning questions, um, we're happy to um, respond to those offline. Um, please feel free to reach out and thank you all very much for your time and thank you matt and um for organizing this this session wonderful thank you all so much what a wonderful session and the recording will be up uh later today on youtube uh if anyone wants to revert back but thank you so much and i hope you guys enjoy uh your holidays and if you're joining us for december 17th uh we'll glad to see you there Thanks very much for joining. Bye-bye.